And while you'd never know it, these crickets are actually healthier than many of the foods we consider nothing short of irresistible. They're practically vegetarian insects. Their meat provides high protein content, is low in cholesterol, and it won't make you fat. Besides that, it's inexpensive, abundant, and easy to find. And as far as taste goes, well, the truth is it's kind of like chicken. Wild crickets constitute just one of the 1,462 edible insect species registered to date. Many of them are familiar enough, for they've been part of the human food experience since man first appeared on Earth. Others may seem somewhat more exotic. But however you look at it, insects are a part of the wide range of ingredients that will be eaten in the future, especially given the fact that traditional food production systems and consumption patterns aren't what they used to be. Crocodiles are another alternative source of food for the future. Recent studies have shown that crocodile meat, from head to toe, offers numerous nutritional assets. It has less cholesterol than chicken, for example, and is especially beneficial for the formation and maintenance of human bone and muscle. Crocodile farms in Australia and several Asian countries serve up exquisitely cut fillets, ribs, and even sirloin steaks. There are also plenty of studies on the nutritional benefits of kangaroo meat. In fact, they are just as convincing. The consumption of less cholesterol would almost certainly reduce cardiovascular disease on a grand scale worldwide. Frankly, a change of eating habits with respect to animal proteins is probably imminent. It will certainly depend on us overcoming certain cultural prejudices that keep us from trying a fine ostrich steak or a nutritional plate of fried grasshoppers. But many of us will. The next revolution in the field of human sustenance will probably come from the sea. Without a doubt, the ocean's resources are enormous. The problem is that we've exploited the Earth's water for so long in such an irrational manner that many of its species are in danger of becoming extinct. We learned how to harness the land's resources some 10,000 years ago. That's how agriculture and animal husbandry came about. However, when it comes to the sea, we are still essentially predators. And the fact is, all the progress we've made in the field of fishing techniques have been aimed precisely at increasing our ability to prey on desired species. Thus, we are at the mercy of natural reproductive cycles and the nurturing of the marine animals we eat. And in the end, this is actually a great inconvenience. But if we can harness marine food sources with the same skill that we have harnessed land food sources, we could almost guarantee the advent of the day when hunger on a worldwide scale would disappear. In fact, aquaculture, ocean ranching if you will, might be the greatest challenge for humans looking for viable sources of food for the 21st century. In 100 years, it's estimated that 70.8% of the entire aquatic surface on planet Earth will be the primary source of our protein. That means we are soon to be witness to a development of historical proportions, something we might call the blue evolution. These gilthead bream are raised in captivity. At first, they are fed zooplankton and artemia, a tiny crustacean often used in aquaculture. During their enlarging period, they are basically fed dried pellets of fish meal.
These fish are put on the market weighing between 300 and 500 grams and carry a guarantee assuring they contain the same nutritive value as their natural free-swimming counterparts. Aquaculture has filled a small yet important niche in humanity's nutritional needs for some time now. The cultivation of mussels, oysters and clams, for example, is a well-established industry. But cultivating fish species, well, that's a whole other kettle of fish. The Japanese were the first to delve into the wonders of aquaculture. Around the mid-20th century, they began cultivating the seriola from the tuna family, which is quickly becoming more and more common in markets around the world. Initial attempts did not properly take into account this species' natural maturation cycles. Japanese breeders relied on young specimens caught at sea, which they would then cultivate and send to market once they reached a weight of around four kilos or so. This process was carried out in coastal waters over a period of several months. Currently, the amount of fish bred in this and similar ways increases by about 20 tons per year, a rate that doesn't even remotely threaten traditional commercial fishing. The world's fishing fleets will continue to provide capture levels that aquaculture companies simply cannot compete with. But the world's aquaculture output is closing in slowly but surely. If its total contribution of marine protein to the world's diet is now 25 percent, it shouldn't be too long before it's 50 percent. However, it can't totally replace fishing on a worldwide scale. Supposing that aquaculture techniques continue their steady advance, Experts predict that traditional fishing methods will be superfluous by 2090. At that point, 100% of marine nutrients will come from aquatic farms. But before turning the oceans into the industrial powerhouses we imagine they can become, we'll have to solve a few pesky problems. Among them, somehow managed to reproduce all the different fish species in captivity. Fish are egg layers. They reproduce by laying million and millions of eggs, of which only a few actually become fish. And the fact is, the circumstances under which newborn fish must paddle or perish are nothing short of precarious. Fish are extremely delicate creatures they lack nutritional reserves and are very sensitive to external factors such as water temperature, salinity, or acidity. You might even say that what's really exceptional is that any of them survive at all. But of course, that's precisely why females lay so many eggs. The situation is much easier on land, where animal offspring have a much higher probability of survival. Marine biologists have been working for years in an attempt to solve these challenges. At this point, the complete cultivation cycle has been solved for several species, such as salmon, sea bass, gilt-head bream, and turbot. However, cultivation conditions still oscillate within incredibly narrow margins, where even the slightest environmental variation might cause total havoc. Raising little fish is difficult because we don't know exactly what they eat. There are other problems, too. This is a very complicated process, such as the tank conditions for the offspring. 
the water quality and the amount of light they receive. At present, red bream and sole are fairly easy to breed, but it took over 10 years of in-depth studies to achieve this. First, we discovered what type of food to give them. And from that point, we established water conditions, overall environment, and the luminosity they needed for reproduction.